Hello and welcome. Welcome to Alta Live. My name is Beth Spotswood. I'm the digital editor of Alta Journal Magazine. Um, and I am so excited to welcome you today to a conversation with Wajahat Ali, um, all about his new book, Go Back to Where You Came From. So if you are here for that conversation, you are absolutely in the right place. As our audience fills in, I will do some brief introductions and um, take care of some a little uh, light housekeeping. Welcome, welcome. So we are, again, we are here um, with today's guest, Wajahat Ali. His new book is called Go Back to Where You Came From and Other Helpful Recommendations on How to Become American. Wajahat's work has appeared in the New York Times, uh, The Guardian, The Atlantic, he's done a TED Talk, and much more. He wrote his first play, The Domestic Crusaders, at the urging, I must give a shout out, at the urging of Alta Journal contributor and dear or close friend of the magazine, Ishmael Reed. Um, Wajahat today will be in conversation with Anjali Kosla. Her writing has appeared in the New York Daily News, The Guardian, numerous other publications, um, including Alta's own newsletter, where she reviewed uh, Wajahat's book. She is a recipient of the 2020 New York Press Club Prize and a 2021 South Asian Journalists Association Award. We have awesome and exciting guests today. You all are in for a treat. Before we begin, um, if you haven't heard of Alta Journal, we are a quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. We have a ton of literary coverage, including a Monday book review, weekly newsletter. In fact, that's where we reviewed Wajahat's book. Um, please do check us out. If you like what we do here today, um, of course, we'd love it if you subscribe to our magazine, but you can also sign up for our free newsletter, attend our free California book club events every month. Um, we're really excited just to kind of welcome you to the party. So hi, there is a Q and A button at the bottom of our video here. Please use that to ask any questions of our guests that you have today. Uh, this interview will be recorded and posted to altaonline.com sometime this afternoon. We're also going to email it to you as well as links where to buy, go back to where you came from, where to read Anjali's review. Um, find out more about the work of both of these great guests today, learn more about Alta. We're going to hit you up with all of that later this afternoon in a hopefully charming email that you enjoy. Um, and before I turn it over to Anjali, I'm hoping that everyone can use the chat um, to let us know where they're Zooming in from today. It's always nice to kind of see where our crowd is, is coming from. I am in Nevada, California, north of the Golden Gate. Um, Anjali, where are you today? Brooklyn. Brooklyn and Wajahat, you are in the center of it the, all. I'm, I'm from in the Mecca of uh, capitalism, Times Square. Nothing says America like literally standing in the middle of Times Square with giant billboards uh, behind me. So I have made it in America. This is why my parents came here. So I can um, be here at this moment. Well, with that, it's it's great to see so we have from all over the United States and Canada so far. So welcome to everyone with that. I'm going to get lost and turn it over to you. Hi, comrade. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? It's nice to see so many people from the Bay. A lot of Bay folks here. Welcome from the motherland. California representing. I'm so happy to be talking to you again. You know, as Beth mentioned, I wrote a bit about the book for the Alta newsletter. I was looking at it earlier. My poor editor had to cut so much. There was so much I wanted to write about out of this book. But there is a word that I think might have gotten lost in the editing that I wanted to just drop here, which is I was reading it and I realized I no longer say anywhere in the in the in the piece that the book is funny. And the book was funny. So I just I was like, I was like that's sort of a bit of an omission. So I wanted to like correct the record here and add that in. But also that not only was it funny, but there was a lot, you know, as you and I talked about the last time we chatted, a lot that resonated with me personally. And so much that I didn't get to talk about in that piece. So I thought we could just jump in and talk about some of that stuff I didn't have space for now. Let's do it. I am here in Times Square for you, Anjali. Likewise from Brooklyn. So, you know, you talk about throughout the book, you talk about this idea of whiteness in mm. various ways. And one incident that really stood out to me was you bring up this incident involving a Sikh American in 1919, Bhagat Singh Vind. And Bhagat basically argued at the time that he was entitled to US naturalization 
because he was, he, he claimed that he was white, that he was, a, you know, a Hindu of high caste, like all these different arguments, and that that was why, according to the laws of the land at the time, he was entitled to naturalization because white people were entitled to naturalization. And, you know, I, for me, you know, that made me think about how whiteness and Americanness, you know, are still so tied together, maybe unconsciously, maybe, maybe, you know, in various ways for many pe different people, you know, in the South Asian communities that, you know, exist all across this country. That's what, that's what kind of started coming to mind for me. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that anecdote and why you brought it into the book and like what connection that, that sort of has to you in terms of what's going on now and the way that we see ourselves and our, and our, um, and our relationship to whiteness. Yeah, so, so the book, uh, I often say, is about trying to love a country that doesn't love the rest of us back. And how do you love a country that treats you as both a citizen and a suspect and turns on you on a dime where you're both us and them and you're an other, even though you're a citizen, right? And no matter what you do, if you're a certain ethnicity or a certain skin color, or if you have ovaries, <laughs> the country says, yeah, you can belong, but you can be a sidekick or you'll be a villain or you'll be completely excised from the story because your story makes some of our children uncomfortable, right? And so it's an elegy for the rest of us not named J.D. Vance. And in connecting this story, I thought, you know, it's, it's a culturally specific story. Not everyone is Pakistani, not everyone is Muslim, not everyone's left-handed or wore husky pants or grew up in the Bay Area like me, but there's enough entry points here where if you're a person of color and you trace your people's history in this thing called America, you realize that, huh, it seems that average American, the Rust Belt, real American, Main Street, blue collar worker are doing a lot of heavy lifting for white. And when it comes to what is American, it's white. And, and you know, this is something that we often talk about, talk about as a lived experience of being a person of color, but oftentimes, as you related to that case I cited, this, this exquisite case of the, this 10 v United States, where this brilliant Indian immigrant. This guy was so badass. Like this guy is going to make our parents like we should never mention this, uh, uh, this man to like our immigrant parents because they're like, you have wasted your life. This guy fought in World War One. This guy went to UC Berkeley. This guy was like a PhD, right? It was an immigrant. And around this time, he used the Supreme Court's own rationale, which they used to reject the citizenship petition of a Japanese American. man. And they said, no, no, no. In order to be a citizen, you have to prove that you're Caucasian. So Tint says, well, hell, I'm Caucasian. My people are the Aryans. In fact, I am closer to Caucasian than many of you whites. And so from your own definition, oh, white Supreme Court justices, I'm white. I should get citizenship. And so it shows you how whiteness in America has and will do these intellectual gymnastics and Cirque du Soleil feats to always protect uh, the privilege of those in power, often those with white complexion, the Supreme Court then says, no, 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 you know, even though you are intellectually correct, most of the people nowadays uh, see Caucasian based on com complexion. A and most of the, the average Jose or the average Joe would deem a person of lighter complexion to be white, not someone like you. And boom, they denied him. And so what you see with the whiteness is that, yes, um, even though people have been here and they've been through the hazing, like Irish Catholics, you know, Eastern European Jews, uh, the Italians, right? They were seen as the invaders of the twenties, but they were able to absorb into this thing called whiteness. Whereas a lot of those Indians and Arab American Christians and black folks and indigenous folks who've been here longer than then are still seen as the other, or as Mitch McConnell said, African Americans are voting as high in higher rights as Americans, right? I thought that was so pure. This happened a couple of weeks ago. I don't think he was doing it deliberately. It's the rest of us, as Toni Morrison said, always have hyphens and we always have an asterisk next to American. We will never be white, no matter how, no matter, as I mentioned in the book, no matter how many South Asians and Asians who have bought into the, the, the very harmful model minority myth, no matter how much you chase whiteness, you'll never be white. And this country will remind you of that on, almost on a daily basis. I've been thinking a lot, this, this idea of the asterisk connects to the word American really connects to this other thing I've been thinking about a lot in the past few years, which is, you know, there've been a lot of proclamations in the last few years, you know, about, you know, these proclamations about, from 
you know, white communities about helping people of color in various ways, especially black people. You know, I'm speaking as a brown person, as a South Asian person, but you know, it's just been, it's hard for me to know how much to like trust these proclamations, like how deep they go um, for various ways. And there was one thing in the book that really kind of brought that feeling back to me, which was you talk about in the book after 9-11, you and you know your, your fellow like Muslim American students get called in by the university administration at your college, you know, ostensibly to kind of check in and see how you're doing because as you and I were the exact same age as we both remember. I look was- much older than you. I thought you were in your early 30s. Well done, Anjali. Well done on the well, genes. I have aged terribly. Uh, I literally thought I was like old enough to be your uncle, but so uh, <laughs> well done. Well done. Uh, both 1980 kids. And you know, <laughs> Empire and- Strikes Back kids, correct. Exactly. But, you know, so the university administration, they call you in, like, you know, like ostensibly just checking how you're doing. We remember it was a scary, yeah. violent time. We were scared for, I was scared for my father. I was scared for my brother. Like, you know, people who looked like us were getting attacked, like see people were getting shot. Like it was a scary time. And so they call you in to kind of see how you're doing. And you start to realize, oh, um, they're also checking in to see if I'm going to, if we're going to cause them a problem, if they should be scared, you know? And I, sorry, I, I don't, but I just, you know, I just kind of like, you know, wonder how do we believe in this white allyship and this like, you know, you know, the, all these proclamations when deep down whiteness, like pure whiteness, so much of it is afraid of us. Yeah, that, you know, you're the second person to mention that scene that really stuck out for them. Actually, it was you and Mary Trump. Like of all the things in the book, she goes, that just stuck with me. And you never know, like when you're writing a story or when you're telling your your personal narrative, to me, it's so like, oh, it's almost like flippant. But then I realize, oh, this is not normal, right? And so what, what the story that Anjali's uh, mentioning, for those of you who not read the book yet, is 9-11 happened. I'm a senior at UC Berkeley. I'm 20 years old. I'm undeclared. I'm trying to figure out what the hell to do with in my life. I'm a bad Desi kid. I'm not becoming a doctor, engineer, or lawyer. I'm like, I most likely will become an English major. We're sitting in our pajamas at UC Berkeley, right? Yeah, me and Anjali are the failures of our of our ancestors. Our ancestors came here to America, so we would like study literature. Like they're crying in their graves right now. But you know, the two towers fall, I'm in my pajamas, and we sit there, and we, we like everyone, we're like, this, what's happening? And the first, when the first tower went down, I, I, like, this country went mad after 9-11. I remember when the first tower went down, I was like, okay, pilot malfunction, pilot malfunction, you know, mistake. Second one hits, we're like, this is intentional. And then you see the Chiron, Al-Qaeda could be to blame. And then we're like, I remember, and I think I mentioned this in the book, I closed my eyes, and almost like I had a vision where I saw the next 10 years and I just saw it. I saw the war and terror. I saw the hazing. I saw the bullying. And I remember I opened my eyes and I told my roommate, we have to get to work. We have to do a lot of work. And I was also a member of the Muslim Student Association. And I always joke, you need dark humor, that if Muslims knew that 9-11 would happen, I would have joined the Indian Student Association instead, finally learned how to bhangra, gone on some good dates with some cute girls, you know, yeah, done the twist of the light bulb, learned good spelling. Uh, IT tech support, you know, but instead it was the first time I saw Muslims. I was oftentimes a token Muslim. I'm like, oh, Muslim. So I joined the social club called the Muslim Student Association. And in my final year that year, I was elected to the student body. So we get this call from the chancellor and like the number two, I think was the president. Come meet us. So I remember how we go and like, it was just, it was quiet. There was a, there was just an air of a somberness, right? You remember that, the day of 9-11, like people were confused. And I remember we go, and we go into the um, the chancellor's office in huge ceilings. Like, is that is that me with the with the? Do you hear that? That's, that's probably Times Square behind me. Pardon me. There's like this revving engine. That's all I want to bother you guys. So we go, and it's like this huge room. Us five, chancellor, the president, and number three, and they were like, you know, listen, this happened. Do you guys need any help? You know, we we can use some help from you. I'm like, sure. But then they also said do you guys plan on doing anything? And I can tell you from the tone and the way they asked the question, it was almost like, should we be aware of trouble coming from your group? And so I was like, huh. And overnight we were treated as suspects. And since my roommate friggin' put my email on the mother effing website, guess who got all the awesome unsolicited hate mail? I did from that day. So this is how bigotry is so stupid and so vicious. Anjali mentioned that the first hate crime after 9-11, a few days after 9-11, was Balbir Singh, a sick man in Arizona who had a beard and a turban, right? I, being born and raised in the Bay Area, California, to Pakistani Muslim immigrants, was now blamed 
by random Americans for two towers that were brought down by 19 foreign hijackers. And from that moment on, for those of us who thought we were the model minority and achieved the American dream, we were Osama. We were, uh, you know, we were Saddam. We were ISIS. And growing up, I remember the worst thing I was called was Gandhi. They used to call me Gandhi to make fun of me. And I always used to be like, oh, you compared me to a beloved nonviolent pacifist leader who helped overthrow, you know, decades of British imperialism. Like, shut up, fatty, because I was also fat. But, you know, overnight, the villain became this thing called Islam. And I always tell people, it wasn't just Muslims who got hit. It was anyone who looked Muslimy. Six Indian Hindus, Arab Christians, uh, brown folks. It was so nutty that Muslim women born and raised in America who used to wear hijab were like, should we come to school? And so for the rest of us, I'm like, dude, I'm 20 years old. I'm, a, I'm trying to figure out my major. But then overnight, we have to be a community activist, representative of this thing called Islam, defend like all our people, uh, you know, also figure out your major and then also condemn violent acts done by violent people we've never met for the next 20 years. And it was never enough. Like Toni Morrison said, that's the thing with racism. It's so exhausting. No matter how much you prove your civilizational worth, it's never enough, Anjali. You're never civilized enough. You're never literate enough. You're never moderate enough. Where is the moderate Muslim? No, it's never enough. I, I wrote a little bit about this once for The Guardian, but I remember right after 9-11, I went on a road trip with my dad. He was supposed to take a flight and my mother and I didn't want him to go on this trip and the flight was canceled. And so I was put in the car almost as a human shield on the road trip. Like, look, he's a young woman. And we stopped at a gas station in um, near Madison. And there were, this, it was shortly after 9-11 and they had put up this, it was run by South Asians and they had put up American flags everywhere. And where they had run out of physical fabric flags, they had drawn them in crayon and put them up. I would, it was, it would have been funny if it weren't so terrifying. And so this, you know, this asterisk really like, like re I really connect with that because it was really like that these flags were being held up as shields in front of all of us, mm. even if we were being whipped by them, right? Like, like yeah. we were really, like, literally at like at the same time they were weapons used against us, we were like holding them up in desperate, like 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 as white flags to like. We're American. We're American. We don't have one flag. We have two flags, and I have the Uncle Sam hand, and I have a like white. Flag flag pin and I you know I was in Fremont California and there's a street belovedly called Little Kabul and Little Kabul because Fremont at the time had the highest number of Afghans outside of like Afghanistan and Germany and Pakistan because the Afghan refugees after the Soviet invasion many of them came to Fremont so there's a street there still called Little Kabul with amazing Afghan restaurants shout out to Fremont um, and you went to that street after 9-11 because, you know, I used to live in Fremont, I used to come back from UC Berkeley, and I felt so bad for these Afghan uncles and aunties, because they plastered with flags. It's almost like you had to do a flag off to prove that you're moderate, right? And then the media descended, especially when there was the Afghan war, and they had to, like, prove their moderation. And you can't blame them because you're outnumbered, you're outgunned, you're a marginalized community. The, America went so crazy, you young bucks, we're old timers that they renamed French fries briefly into freedom fries because France and Germany were not initially aiding us. So Donald Rumsfeld said, that's old Europe. So we used to call French fries freedom fries. I never, not we, who's this I never Oh yeah, not we, not you and me. Uh, and, then, and then they canceled Susan Sontag, or beloved Susan Sontag, remember that? Because she wrote an essay, Clear Channel, which is like one of these, you know, massive corporations that like runs these public, uh, the, the radio channels, they iced, a, the entire catalog of Rage Against the Machine and Beatles, the John Lennon song, Imagine. And then Dixie Chicks, who at the time, now known as the Chicks, in 2003 were like the most beloved white women on earth. They had the top of the world tour, like fusion crossover country rock, like three really cute blonde white women who like had really amazing songs. Natalie Maines, the lead singer, all she said was this, I'm embarrassed that George W. Bush is from Texas. Bye, y'all. That's all she said. They took tractors over her CDs. They bonfires, right? And so the rest of us were like, yo, if America is willing to turn on the Dixie Chicks, what are they going to do to us? Patricia, they actually did call French fries uh, freedom fries. That was actually something that happened on, on the right wing as, back in those as days. The Midwest, as a Midwesterner, I can tell you that phrase was absolutely used. Yeah. Yes. We used to laugh about it. We used to laugh about it, but for a while it was called Freedom Fries. You know, but this also makes me think of something else you talk about, which is this idea of um, citizenship in America being conditional. 
What do you mean when you say it's conditional? I think we're getting close to that. Yeah, uh, uh, because what I said is citizenship is conditional in the sense that just belonging in the word American is conditional, right? Uh, for, I'll give you an example. For some, they're allowed to overtake the United States Capitol because they're upset about a legitimate election. And instead of being seen as violent insurrectionists or terrorists, um, they're called uh, ordinary citizens engaging in legitimate political protest. That's what the RNC, the Republican National Committee, described the hundreds of protesters who overtook the US Capitol. Uh, some folks are known as lone wolf, uh, disturbed uh, individuals with mental health issues when they commit mass shooting. Uh, some people, they have economic anxiety when they vote for a vulgar racist. Uh, some people are asked to understand the anxiety uh, of these individuals who voted against their own interests and voted for a man who was cruel and racist, right? Everything bends its knee in America. Every institution, the rhetoric, the framing bends its knee to satiate and placate white rage and white anxiety and the whiteness. The rest of us eh, are exempt as it's conditional. Uh, we belong one day and then we don't belong. I'll give you an example. Uh, American citizens of Japanese descent during World War II, they were Americans of Japanese descent. People oftentimes say it was the Japanese internment, which is wrong. It was the American internment of Japanese Americans. Their citizenship did not protect them, ladies and gentlemen. Overnight, just destroyed. And that trauma lasted for generations, right? Chinese immigrants came here, built the railroads, right? Even then, you know, they didn't integrate. They weren't asked to integrate. So all they did was, okay, we're going to create our own small little island, our little enclave, our Chinese ghetto. Even that was too threatening. And before the election, people said, ah, yellow peril, yellow invasion, Chinese Expulsion Act of 1882, right? You see this happening again and again and again, that even when you have citizenship, it's still <clears throat> not enough for your rights to be taken away from you, right? Post-war on terror. Muslim groups, Muslim institutions, Muslim charities, all were under attack. The FBI came and must have interviewed thousands. One number says up to 50,000 people. We already had a registry called NSEERS, which was finally disbanded under Obama, but immigrants just were deported, like 12,000 immigrants just deported. That was the registry, and they found a small glitch, most of them from Muslim-majority countries and North Korea, gone, right? And so you see, huh, I'm a citizen, but I don't get the equal rights. I'm a citizen, but I can't demand equal standards. I'm a citizen, but some of us don't get equal pay. I don't get the equal loan, but I do get a war on terror. I do get the war on drugs. I do get called an invader. I am accused of replacing us. I thought I was us. Oh no, I'm not, I'm them. Oh, there's a Muslim ban now. Oh, the president gets to mock us and ridicule us. Oh, they're coming after my charities and my organizations. Oh, we're doing a special hearing in Congress about the unique radicalization of Muslim communities, but not a word about the number one domestic terror threat in America, which is white supremacy. And that's where you see even citizenship sometimes does not protect you in America if you have the wrong complexion. Yeah. As Francisco said, right. Mexicans, right? Trump, when he came down the fake golden staircase, which wasn't golden staircase, the first thing he said, he goes, we want the good immigrants coming, not the Mexican rapists and criminals. And you know, then the wall, which Mexico never paid for. Then the 2018 midterm where he was writing, actually good economic growth and jobs. What did he do instead? The entire party said caravan filled with rapists, refugees, MS-13 Middle Easterners are coming to replace us. That meant black, brown, Mexican folks and Muslims. Yeah. Are we citizens? Are we treated equally? I mean, yes, but uh, with conditions. Yeah, I think it's just like we're, of course, like we have all these equal rights, but some, maybe not the same equal right to feel safe all the time or the equal right to take certain things for granted, to take that what we have now is permanent. Well, even this, right? Like the analogy I give is the following. I think what we're dealing with the death rattle of white supremacy that has become the death march is like this, because the title of the book is Go Back to Where You Come From. I get that email almost every day, which is hilarious because I always joke, well, Fremont, California, the Bay, if you could subsidize my rent, I'd love to. Do you want, do you want to go Freudian? Uh, do you want to go to uh, my mother's womb? Do you want to go pre-partition India? When my parents were, my families were originally from Hyderabad before they went to Karachi, right? Lahore, uh, Lahore right? Oh, look at you. Fancy schmancy, of course, Punjabi. 
uh, you guys have the numbers. Uh, but the thing is, just this that that phrase, go back to where you came from. What that means is, you don't belong. I belong. This is my country. This belongs to me. You are a guest in my country. You are not the co-owner of the house. I allow you to rent a room. And you need to know your place. In fact, you should be grateful for the freedoms and rights you have. If you don't like it, get out. And that analogy I always give is that now that we're demanding to be co-owners of the house that legally belongs to us, they say you're replacing us. And the analogy that I gave is if it comes to even sharing a room in the house or burning down the house, there is a significant minority in this country and in Europe, ladies and gentlemen, that is electing to burn down the neighborhood. They'll burn it all down. If they can't be on top, none of us will be on top. And that's condi conditional citizenship. Yeah, and you know, like this whole litany of stuff you're, you just described from the Capitol riots on down. I know that there are a number of younger people watching this. You know, all of this stuff, you know, it takes a huge mental toll on people. In the past few years have been mentally um, exhausting to say the least. And, you know, you write a lot about your own mental health struggles in the book and how trauma exacerbated them. We've been going through a period of great trauma. You know, I wonder if you could talk a bit about, you, you, you talk about this a bit in the book about how, you know, and again, you know, South Asian communities aren't monolith. Um, it's not a monolith, right? So these are, it, there's a diversity of everything within the South Asian diaspora. However, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe some of the struggles or difficulties we have talking about mental health. In oh, yeah. this, because, you know, I, I'm a college professor and I do get surprised sometimes when I interact with students and I'm surprised to find out that they're still coming from families that maybe this is a very taboo topic and that they're not getting the support that they need. Like why? Why is this such a hard thing for like parts of our community to really, really talk about and accept as a real thing? Yeah. So in the book, I mentioned that my father and I uh, have obsessive compulsive disorder, which is an anxiety disorder. Right. And oftentimes in our communities, in many communities, you're supposed to suffer quietly. You're taught to suffer well. Uh, our immigrant parents came and they hustled and they had grit and they didn't have time to whine and complain and shake it off, right? This mental health and going to a therapist, this is a white man's problem. This is a privileged Gora people thing. And they go sit on couches like Woody Allen. We don't sit on couches. We work. What are you talking about? And also when you come from religious communities, you just have to pray it away. Pray harder. This is a testament to your lack of faith. If you just had better optimistic attitude and you prayed harder, you would not have depression, right? You would not have anxiety. So for the person that's suffering, it's extra shame and guilt. Oh my God, there's something defective in me. I'm not praying enough. I'm not grateful enough. And they're right. I am privileged. And oh my God, my parents did do so much. And oh my, there, there's something defective about me. And then also there's another component about lokya bolinge, which translates to what will people say? We always have to present the fiction of our lives. Smile with white teeth showing. Never show the tears. We have a good family. We come from a good marriage. We're good people where everyone is good and perfect. And we had good kids. We're going to go to good colleges and get good degrees and have a good wife and uh, husband and get good kids. And the cycle re will repeat, right? It's all good. We're the model minorities. Everyone's smiling. Everyone's happy. See, everyone's happy. Everyone smile. Look, we came here with nothing. And now we have the Toyota. Now we have the BMW. Now we have the home. Smile, everybody. Never talk about the divorce. Never talk about the, the spousal abuse, never talk about the mental health, never talk about the poor, poverty, because lo kya kenge. And people will be cruel, and they'll be judgmental, and they'll, they'll cut our nose in public. Figuratively, there's a phrase. So everyone, if you think about it, Anjali, creates a loop of fiction. It's just fiction. And in that fiction, to preserve this myth of the American success, this myth that you've made it, this myth that you come from the good family, this myth that is oftentimes fueled by shame, uh, we suffer and we're taught to suffer well. And we don't talk about the dirty laundry because if you air the dirty laundry, our marginalized communities that don't have power will then be mocked at and ridiculed further by the mainstream gays. So never air our dirty laundry, Anjali, and keep everything buried. You see what I'm saying? It's all connected. And so instead, what you see are people who suffer. They get the model minority checklist they get the good home, they get, they get the American dream, but you and I have friends at a certain age that you know that they're miserable, right? They're miserable. 
uh, they suffer from depression, they suffer from something. Thank you, Lisa, for st sticking around. And so we don't talk about it because we fear that if we talk about it, we will be revealing weakness. We will be making ourselves vulnerable. That vulnerability will be exploited. It will be attacked both by our community members who will say, ha, 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 look at the Kosla family. Ha, 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 look at the Ali family. And then also from the mainstream, which is code word for white, that we didn't fit in. And so people just suffer and they suffer quietly. And so what I've seen in this book in particular is by mentioning in the book poverty, by mentioning mental health and by mentioning my parents arrest in the criminal justice system, I assumed at first, you know what, bring it. I've, I've heard it all. I've been mocked, I've been ridiculed, I've been homeless. The community has turned on me, the checklist has blown up. Um, no problem, I'll take it. But you will be surprised Anjali, not a single email or message. Overwhelmingly, it's like, thank you. Thank you for sharing this. I appreciate it. I didn't know that you could talk about this. I've seen that people have embraced your story. Maybe I can tell my story. You gave me courage. It gives me, like, it just gives me comfort to know that someone has articulated something that I was, I was unable to voice in my words. I also went through this. And look, people didn't mock you. They embraced you. Maybe they'll embrace me. All the needs is a few people. And then I always joke, the last thing I'll say is, especially with Desi men, I would say, men, and forget Desi, men. Men are not taught... Uh, Men have this very antiquated toxic stereotype, and I'm kind of like this, this old Spartan male, where men are just supposed to take it. We're tough. We're Spartan. We don't cry. We don't share emotions. We fix it. And we just bottle everything inside, and we move on. That's what men do. And then you see like an uncle who dies at the age of 62. And you're like, huh, he was so healthy. What happened? <laughs> what happened is the guy's probably suffering from like depression, anxiety, shame, right? And so this, this, this very toxic understanding of masculinity in which sharing emotions or crying is seen as weakness also contributes, I think, to this culture where so many of our elders, if they, I joke, I joke like if the men were, especially like uncles and aunties, I'm talking about immigrant men, were given a choice, okay, you can get 10 extra years of life and there'll be very good years of life if you cry once, one tear, or you die at the age of 65, uncles will be like, death, give me death. I'll just die now. I'll die now. I'm like, you're not 65 yet. I'll just die now. And so that's a profoundly unhealthy narrative and model that we've created, Anjali, that has been passed down from generation to generation that in a way of, instead of it showing strength, it has crippled us, in my opinion. You asked me a simple question. Thank you for letting me go on my TED Talk. No, I think it's really important. A lot of white men are also suppressing a lot of this stuff. Also, yeah, men, just men. Various effects. And so I think, you know, it is so important that, you know, like you do, doing what you're exactly what you're doing and talking about it. I think that's the, the way forward and through all of this. I do, you know, speaking, speaking of um, talking about stuff, I'd like to let the audience ask a few questions before we let you go. Maybe Beth could let some people. I will answer them quickly, Beth, I promise. Um, this is so mind blowing and fascinating. And this has been such a great conversation. Our super engaged audience has more questions for you. Um, uh, let's kind of, I'm going to go in random order. Beth here. is paid um, to say that, by the way, she is paid to say. I'm that not, no, I'm not, I'm not, not at all. I, this is fantastic. Um, uh, so Michelle, right. She's a white woman living in Fremont. Uh, yet another shout out to Fremont. Fremont. Let's do an Alta event from Fremont. Um, Fremont appears to be a mini universal entity where white, Asian, Indian, Afghani, African Americans can all live in quasi peaceful and healthy environment. In your opinion, what can be done or changed to have more Fremonts around the United States? Very quickly, I mentioned in the book that Fremont is both the symbol, the barrier to me is a symbol of the American dream and the American nightmare. The American dream in the sense that it's a multicultural utopia where you've created, where people have created the American dream, but at the same time, the rampant uh, classism. Uh, the fact that it's increasingly segregated, the fact that so many people who have made it still suffer quietly, the gentrification, right? It's like a beautiful, it's almost like a David Lynch movie where on the outside, it's like blue velvet. Everything's manicured and pretty, but it's just to look a little bit deeper. There is like pain and sadness, right? So that's my take on the Fremont and the Bay Area. I lived there for 32 years I, and I experienced both extremes. I was there as a model minority kid who grew up in the suburbs and I was also there 
as a kid at the age of 21 whose parents went to jail and was homeless and lost everything. I saw a, a place where the community helped build me up and that same community brought me down. I saw it as a place where people judge you based on your material wealth and people are killing themselves literally to keep up with the Joneses. And secretly when you talk to them, they're like, I'm dying, I'm dying. And so that's where I see with Fremont. But when it comes to the ethnicity, and diversity, yeah, I was very lucky. I went to an all-boy Jesuit Catholic high school, Filipino friends, black friends, Desi friends, Sikh friends, at little Kabul, like pho. And it shows you that like, you know, we can get along people. Like it, you know, that's the beautiful thing about the Bay Area, the, the type of ethnic diversity that we have. It exposes you at a very young age to the different cultures that exist in America and gives you a cultural literacy that I think most Americans can benefit from. Uh, similarly, along the same lines, um, Guatam asks, as an Indian Hindu American living in Arizona, I've never experienced any racism and living very comfortably as a model minority. Why is the term model minority harmful? Um, as you'd mentioned, Wajahat, I'm raising a nine-year-old. Any tips to try not to put any added pressure on him? Oh, wow. Uh, I got three kids, Gautam. So model my, the reason why I'm so, um, uh, like, you know, why the model minority myth is toxic is the model minority myth, as mentioned in the book, flattens and erases all of us, right? It essentializes all of us uh, and gives us this stereotype that we are the good minorities. We are the ones who made it. We suffer quietly and we are accepted by America because we pull ourselves up from the bootstrap. We work hard. We have grit. We don't whine. We don't complain. We don't talk about racism. We don't rock the boat. We row the boat. We're like sugar. We dissolve. And in exchange for our acceptance, uh, our, uh, the Faustian bargain is invisibility. We stay quiet. We won't become the CEO, but we'll become the assistant CEO. We won't become the protagonist, but we'll be the, the, the sidekick. And our job is just to take it, but not just take it. We then become enforcers of the whiteness. We become enforcers of white supremacy because we, especially South Asians and Asians, are often then used to attack poor people of color, black folks and brown folks. Why can't you blacks be like Anjali? Why can't you poor mm -hmm. refugee be like what you, look at he's not whining and complaining he came here with nothing they pulled themselves up from their bootstraps and it allows you to completely gloss over white supremacy double standards inequities right and instead promote this myth of meritocracy and as Martin Luther King said you tell me to pull myself up from my bootstraps well give me a boot first and some would say well you're telling me to pull myself up from my bootstrap but first you got to take the boot off my neck and so oftentimes is when people of color who come here, like my parents' generation post-1965, they internalize this being the special minority, the good minority. And you're like, aha, whites like me, I've made it. And then for many of my peers and my elders, 9-11, baptism by fire. Mm -hmm. Everything that we did fell apart. But, and then and there's so many of those uncles and aunties, I felt bad. They're like, but I did everything right. I did everything right. No, nope, still a terrorist. But I did everything right. Now nah, go back to where you came from. And they're like, wow, it wasn't enough. It's never enough. It's always conditional. And then slowly but surely in the past 20 years, war and terror, Trump, people are realizing, oh, we're actually closer to blackness than whiteness in this country. Huh. And that's often a rude awakening, which is why I think the model minority stereotype is very uh, painful and inaccurate. We're getting so many great questions and I know we're Richard, ahead, Richard. So Richard, your immigrants' parents didn't speak uh, Tagalog at home. My parents, so you want to, so this is a comment from Richard. Richard says my immigrant parents purposely didn't speak Tagalog at home so we would assimilate. My parents didn't give an F. They named me Wajahat. They brought the boat inside the home. They didn't teach me English until I went to school. They literally dropped me off without any, they didn't even tell me where I was going. They just dropped me off at Charles Hathaway preschool. And I say in the book, I only knew three phrases of English. And then it, I had to take ESL, another traumatic experience. And then finally, like 35 years later, my mom's like, Beta, we should have taught you English. But look, you turned out fine. So there you go. Two, di two different I extremes of your parenting. I meant to say at the beginning, your English was very good. Thank you. I speak well. So it's do you. Like a 
Um, we're, we're getting so many great questions and I so appreciate this engaged audience. I'm going to ask two more because we okay. are rapidly running out of time. Um, Francisco asks, is there anything, and I, I'm so curious about this as well, was there anything in the publishing process of Ooh. your book that revealed to you tangibly the institutional racism in the publishing industry? Yes. Um, in every industry that I've been in, you, you, you get to see it. I'll, I'll explain how. First and foremost, the pay. Uh, second of all, the representation, the people who don't look like you, whether they're editors or agents, the fact that a very established award-winning writer of color told me right before the book tour a month and a half ago, be sure that you're hands-on in the publicity and marketing of your book because the white gatekeepers will F it up and pigeonhole you. And this is a guy who's won an awards, right? The fact that um, some people said to me throughout my entire career, you will have to make your ethnic story pal palatable to the mainstream. Translation, listen, Darkie, uh, you, you need to put more whites in this story and whites will not be comfortable with the story. And so take out the Urdu and take out the Islam and take out the merch and take out the masala and take out the phrases like Dadi and Dada and instead say grandmother and grandfather because the whites won't be able to take it. I heard this throughout my career. Even when it came to my play, I mentioned this as a funny story. A Hollywood producer loved my play. He said, I want to bring the play to LA. I'm like, sure. He goes, have you thought about casting? I'm like, you tell me. Uh, he goes, okay, what about the, the, the Salman, the Pakistani immigrant father? Who have you thought of? I'm like, well, you have a name? He goes, I have a name. I'm like, hit me with it. Ted Danson. I'm like, from <laughs> Cheers? He goes, yes. I'm like, for the Pakistani? I was, like, I was like, you, Beth. I started laughing. There was silence on the other end. He goes, I'm serious. Americans like Ted Danson. And throughout my entire career, aggressively, and I say this to people of color oftentimes because they think, oh, people like Anjali and Wajahat, they must have sold out to make it because I didn't make it. So you guys compromise. And I say, yeah, some people quote unquote sold out, but you have no idea the type of hurdles that we have to endure mm -hmm. to make it as a person of color without selling out. Does that make sense? Like we could have gone much further. I could have made way more money selling certain narratives, but I chose not to. And I rejected that, that stupid advice given to me about taking it, you know, making it more mainstream. And I said, no, thank you. And if you've seen my career, I've written very authentically. I've written very personally because I always had faith, ladies and gentlemen, in the people. I have faith in white people. My favorite whites are the moderate whites, I must say, but I have faith in white people. I think white people, like every other person, like me, you know, I didn't know English growing up. I saw The Godfather. I saw all these white movies with white characters. I was able to empathize with the storylines. I was able to learn and research. I don't think you have to hold the hands of the whites. I think if you give white people a good story, they'll show up. And I'll give you a personal analogy about this is when I took my white friends to authentic Pakistani food, right? My white friends were like, yo, where was this? I didn't know this existed. I just had chicken tikka masala. You were holding out on me. And then I remember like, First, they used to like say, Wajad, place the order for me. Then they said, Wajad, I'm going by myself. Wish me luck. And now, 2022, I'm standing in line, picking up Kana for food from like my Desi restaurant. And like you got the white guy saying, okay, I want the goat cry. And this time put some extra garam masala on it. And listen, last time you shorted me out on the Imli. Give me more, more Imli. What I'm trying to say is you can hold their hands. So the publishing industry, like most industries, is a very white industry mm -hmm. that sees the world from a white gaze. I was very lucky in this regard, and I'll end it on this, is that I was very specific with the team that I chose. And this happened very strategically after the, 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 the protests of George Floyd were for like six months, America like, like became aware just for six months. And in that period, I chose the right team uh, of individuals who had the right frame of reference uh, to do this book. And I'm glad that I did. I, I could have chased the money. I'll also leave it at that. There were some big publishers who came after me that would have given me more money. And I'm glad I didn't. I went for the right publisher. I got paid well. I wrote the book that I wanted the way I wanted. And that's why I succeeded, in my opinion. I do want to say something because it's come up a few times here about success. I mean, look, there are people in like South Asian people who have been very successful and impactful in America. Like it's not like nobody is succeeding, but I do worry that the, that people who do succeed through like hard work and effort and talent and all of that, that, that their success gets weaponized a bit, right? To, to become an example that says, look, there, like there's no problems. Like, like you can make it. Like, like That's you know the what I minority. Think? Yeah, I get, I get concerned about that also is somehow becoming like, uh, sort of well, it, it just to, yeah, and I know we're running out of time. Don't worry, Beth. But like as Anjali said, like just <laughs> for every, they're like 
the, the, to put a pin on it, Wajahat, you wrote a, I got, I got told this, you wrote a book. What racism are you talking about? They allowed you to publish and you got paid. Think about all the people who didn't. Think about all the people who worked so hard and never got the shot. Think about all the people who didn't get the mentorship. Think about all the people who didn't get the promotion. Think about all the narratives that got erased. Look at the CRT bans, ladies and gentlemen. There's no CRT being taught in schools, but books are being banned, right? So what they do is they often use that one model of success to say, see, we elected Barack Obama. There ain't no, uh, there's a post-racial society. And yeah, think about women who to this day, 51% of the population still don't get equal pay. Um, and, and that's why it's important. I'm glad Anjali brought that up it, it, because oftentimes that I am used as an example to show you that, look, America's perfect. Wajahad published his book. What are you talking about? And we conveniently gloss over every other problem. Um, with that, I am so grateful um, to both of you for coming, Wajahat, Anjali. It's been so it's fascinating and enlightening and funny getting to speak with both of you today. Um, I just want to remind everyone as we say goodbye that this event has been recorded and will be emailed to all of you, posted to altaonline.com later today. Also, I wanted to invite everyone to next week's event. I'm so excited to, we're going to have a discussion actually on um, uh, Bret Hart and Mark Twain and this big fight they had over a racist play. Uh, that conversation will feature Alta contributor Joy Lanzendorfer and co-founder of Stop AAPI Hate, Professor Russell Jung. That's on Wednesday, March 2nd at 12.30 p.m. It's historical, it's topical. I, I do hope you'll join us for that as well. Um, again, we're gonna send you links. A lot of people are interested in buying this book. Fantastic, we will send you links to that as well as Anjali's amazing article all about it. Um, again, thank you, thank you, everyone, especially to our guests. Thank you, that, Beth. Thank, thank you, everyone. Beth. Goodbye. Thank you, Anjali. Always fun to talk to you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, all. <laughs>